quick sound check here, folks. Sound check number two. Welcome, nature lovers, to our second now presentation of 2022. I'm Becky Parker. I'm the coordinator of the Young Naturalist Club. And with me today, we're super lucky to have Kathleen and April from the Canadian Sea Turtle Network, who are going to tell us all about turtles and who were super nice and brought us some fun trivia questions for later. So I'm not going to waste too much of our time. I just wanted to orient folks before we get started. So if you look to your chat, either at the far right or the far bottom of your screen, however you have YouTube oriented today, you'll see that I have put in a Kahoot code. So that's for trivia later. If you want to play trivia with us, you can use that code on your Kahoot app, either on your phone or tablet, or you can play the old school way with pen and paper. That's totally fine too. Because we're playing trivia, if you want to play trivia, you will have to pay attention. So keep those listening ears on and your observing eyes open. Um, but with that, without any further ado, I'm going to turn our virtual floor right over to Kathleen, who's on my screen here. So welcome, Kathleen. Do you want to tell us a bit about you and what you're going to talk about today? Um, well, I'm super excited to be here with all of you, and my name is Kathleen Martin. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Sea Turtle Network, and um, my colleague April is here with me again today, or with me today, uh, virtually, <laughs> not in the same room, and um, is going to be uh, hanging out and observing the presentation because she's going to, she's one of our educational presenter, or one of our educational people or educators, excuse me. Um, and so I'm really happy for her to be here too. Uh, and I'm gonna to talk to you about leatherback sea turtles today, which is um, one of the, what is the primary turtle that we study, one of the um, four or five sea turtle species that we find in Canadian waters, the one that we see most often uh, inshore. Um, and uh, I'm gonna show you some pictures and show you some specimens and then we can, um, I'm gonna hide the trivia answers in all there and, um, and we can um, have a chat at the end. So we is is there anything else you wanted to say, Becky, before I get started, or okay, um, so. We have several species of sea turtles that come to Canadian waters. The, the ones that we see the most are leatherback sea turtles and loggerhead sea turtles, but we also have green sea turtles and Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. The greens and the Kemp's Ridleys we don't see as often. Um, that are there, you know, we might see one or two a year of those. Um, the loggerhead sea turtles are found way offshore, so we don't usually see um, them inshore unless there's something wrong with a loggerhead sea turtle. But the turtle that we see the most in the waters that people tend to see the most if they happen to be out sailing, sometimes if they're lucky and they're kayaking, are leatherback sea turtles. And so I'm going to talk to you today about leatherbacks and leatherback turtles are amazing. They're one of my very favorite things in the whole world. Um, they're the largest sea turtle on earth and um, have been here for more than 150 million years. So the species virtually unchanged since the time of the, before the time of the dinosaurs, when T-Rex was on the land, leatherback turtles were in the ocean. So they're amazing. So I'm going to share my screen so you can see my presentation. And I'm going to go back and forth because I, I'm going to want to show you some stuff too. So one second, sorry. I don't know if it's not sharing right now. Great. So this, I'm going to show you, is, can people see this? Okay, this is a video of a leatherback sea turtle swimming in the waters off northern Cape Breton. Um, and you can see these big, long ridges that run the, the length of its top shell, um, or it's what we call its carapace, and it's big, long flippers as it's swimming. This video is amazing to me because it's so hard to get. There it goes on a great big deep dive. And can you see here, if you look in its mouth, you can see it has a giant long lion's mane jellyfish. Oh, wow. it looks like a big rope sticking out of its mouth. 
That's the species that we're gonna be talking about. This is what it looks like in a still photo. So it's a bit easier to identify some of the things about it. So leatherbacks um, don't have, they have a, a leathery skin that covers their carapace. So the top shell of a leatherback is called the carapace and the bottom shell is called the plastron. So its carapace is covered in um, a thick layer of fat and cartilage. And then this kind of skin, this leathery skin covers it in an inky blue color. Um, and it's unlike regular turtles. So if you think of turtles or tortoises, so if you think of Gus at the Natural History Museum, he has scoops, right? Those plates that form the, the form its shell, but for leatherbacks, their um, carapace is formed out of um, a layer of bone covered by this, this um, uh, the cartilage and the fat, and then the um, skin that goes on the top of it. And they're characterized by these really long ridges that run the length of their carapace. Those big, there's seven of them and they're big long lines that run the length of the carapace. And um, I'm gonna just show you, because I want you to see the difference. So this is a piece of kind of regular tur turtle shell. This is actually from a hawksbill sea turtle. Um, and you can see how it's really smooth, right? And it's sort of what we might think of typically of the how, how a turtle, turtle or tortoise shell might feel. And I'm gonna show you this is a piece of a leatherback shell. So this is obviously this is from a, a specimen. So it's from a turtle that's died, but it's also um, all the skin and the fat and stuff has come off of it. But what is really cool is you can see that these shells are made up of hundreds and hundreds of tiny little bones. Each of those little circles is an individual piece of bone that are fit together almost like a giant jigsaw puzzle, which give the leather back a lot of flexibility. So it gives its shell a lot of flexibility. Cause if you think of trying to pick a jigsaw puzzle up, how it kind of has a lot of movement to it, but also is just an amazing, um, a really amazing thing in terms of what well, we'll find out kind of from a, an adaptation standpoint, why it matters. And, um, and it's a really neat um, and beautiful thing. I think about the turtle. I love what the shell looks like underneath the, underneath the carapace. They're also characterized by this pink spot that you find at the top of their, at the top of their, skull, so at the top of their head. So every leatherback turtle has one of these and they come in different sizes. Sometimes they're pink, sometimes they're kind of whitish, sometimes they're orangey, but every single one of them has one. And it's an identifying mark. And sometimes people say it's kind of like a fingerprint, um, but scientists aren't really sure what it's used for. So they don't know for sure. They have a hypothesis that it actually is the lightest spot on a whole dark bodied animal. So the rest of the animal is really dark, dark kind of inky blue color. And then this is the lightest spot part on the whole animal. Sometimes leatherbacks, and this one's pretty neat, you can see how these kind of whitish polka dots um, all over them, but that's kind of in varying degrees, but invariably there's always a pink spot and it covers something, it's, it covers the thinnest part of their skull and it covers something that's there called the pineal gland. And in other animals, they use the pineal gland or the pineal gland is used for navigational purposes. So there's a thought out there, there's a hypothesis out there that leatherbacks actually navigate. So they figure out where they are in the ocean by how the light hits the pineal gland through that pink spot. Um, and actually, let me show you now, I'm going to take a minute, I'm going to show you the skull of a leatherback, because I think that that, is, I'm going to just show you this. So this is what a leatherback skull looks like. Well, that's one second, let me just add this to it so it makes more sense to you. It's so big. They're enormously big. <laughs> this is the, obviously the mandible, which was usually attached. Uh, when they're alive, uh, but you get a sense of how big it is. And this is where you'd find a pink spot, right? Right up here. And actually what's really cool is that if you're able to, and I think April, you've seen this before, but if you're able to see it in a, a recently dead turtle, <laughs> um, if you were to shine a flashlight into this skull, you would be able to see that the light comes up through the top. So it just shows how narrow that piece of um, bone is in here. But the leatherback skull is something that's really amazing. First of all, it's really cool because of its size, right? Um, and then you can see that they have this really sharp point on the, on the bottom of their jaw, which helps them grab their food really easily. Um, they have these great big holes in the side, uh, which are not just for eye sockets. So, because obviously they don't have eyes that are this big, but actually this part of the turtle, this, this one here, if you look at the back, let me show it to you this way. Um, they, they relate to these really big holes in the back of the skull. So this is, this is the back of the leatherback uh, skull. And this area right here, this tiny spot, that's kind of my thumb can fit into, that's where their brain goes. So their brain is the size of your thumb, um, which is surprising in an animal that can be two meters long, right? So they have a little tiny brain and then these great big cavities in their skull where the lacrimal glands hang out. 
So the lacrimal glands are used to get salt out of their body. And they, they, the salt comes out or extrudes through their eyes. So the, the glands occupy the biggest parts of their skull or take up the most space in their skull. And then when you see a turtle on land, sometimes it'll look like it's crying because it'll have like these big tears coming down with all this sand stuck to it. And it looks really sad. And people are like, the mother turtle's crying, which she's not really doing actually. She's just getting all the salt out of her body. Because if you think leatherbacks are in the ocean and they're swimming and they're always uh, dealing with, with salt, like we all know about because we live near the ocean. Um, and I'll just show you too, we have the most amazing model that um, was made for us. You can also see kind of what it looks like as if it were real. So there you can see what the pink spot looks like on the top there. And again, it's just an amazing size. So one of the other things that leatherbacks do really well, and, and this is where this really cool flexible shell comes in, is they're amazing divers. If you remember that video that I showed you, it kind of you could see the leatherback taking this huge, huge deep dive, and they can dive deeper than a kilometer. Um, they can hold their breath for more than an hour underwater. So someone has recorded them. They had an instrument on them that recorded them for more than um, holding their breath for more than 60 minutes on a single dive. But if you remember, again, this flexible kind of jigsaw puzzly shell, what happens when they go really deep when they dive is the shell can, can um, expand and it can compress, right? So that the turtle can manage um, the pressure that's on them when they go on really deep dives. So there's the pink spot obviously on this turtle. And there's a turtle on a dive, which is just the most amazing thing to see because they'll be swimming along, swimming along. And then all of a sudden they just completely disappear. And it's this magnificent kind of moment of it. And you can see it fading really deep into the water. It's just incredible. So this is a really great uh, and picture that means actually a lot to me. It was put together by a, a professor um, who recently died from Acadia University, um, Dr. Sherman Bleakney, who was just a magnificent, amazing man. I loved him so much, really brilliant guy. And he was the first man in the 1960s to talk about leatherback turtles coming to Canadian waters on purpose. Um, and he uh, had a hard time getting people to believe him because they thought, no, these animals exist in, in tropical uh, places where they nest on beaches and they lay their eggs. Why would they ever go up to places where it's freezing cold in winter for part of the year? That doesn't make sense. Um, and the waters are colder. I mean, turtles aren't here in the winter, but they're certainly here um, in the spring, summer, and fall. And our waters are much colder than the waters off, um, off the nesting beach areas. And anyway, uh, Dr. Bleakney Sherman had a lot of uh, really brilliant ideas about why they might be here, which all turned out to be right. But um, he kind of put his research aside because he couldn't get any funding for it because no one thought that what he was proposing made any sense. So, um, and it was only 30 years later that he was proven to be right on every single item. But what he was, was a guy that was fascinated by anatomy. And so he took the, the um, shell that I, or sorry, excuse me, the skull that I showed you um, was one that he had prepared, but he would take the animals that were found dead along the coast of Nova Scotia. There would be leatherbacks that were found dead and he would prepare them. He'd open the, the animal up. He'd do a necropsy, which is like an autopsy, but on an animal. Um, and he would look at what that was in their stomach so he could figure out what they were eating and he would look at their bones. And one of the things that he loved so much um, was that you can see here, this is the, the arm of or the bones from a, the arm of a, a full grown um, adult man. And this is the kind of shoulder, you can see here the shoulder area and the flipper of the leatherback sea turtle and the bones in the wrist and the hand of the human and the bones in the, in the kind of this part of the flipper of the leatherback are exactly the same. They're the same, they match bone for bone um, in terms of their structure, which is a really cool um, and sort of fascinating piece of evolution. So leatherbacks are enormously big, so they can grow just for their carapaces. So just for that top shell up to two meters long, um, they routinely weigh more than a thousand pounds. So you've got um, this is Dr. Mike James, who works with uh, leatherback sea turtles and has done a lot of, um, of the science on them in Canada. This is Blair Fricker, both of the, uh, who was the captain of our sea turtle boat for 20 years. Um, they're both tall people. Mike's over six feet tall, and that's what a leatherback looks like next to them, which is inc incredibly big. This is working off Cape Breton. And this is another leatherback. So you're looking at the size differences, even when they're already big. This was one of the biggest ones we'd ever handled. It had a carapace, just the carapace length of 175 centimeters over the top of it. So then you add a head and you add flippers to the end of it. So it was a, just an enormously big animal. But when leatherbacks start their lives, so, so 
the reason people thought Dr. Bleakney was kind of crazy to think that leatherbacks might be in Canadian waters was usually they're found on nesting beaches in places like South and Central America, the ones that we see in Atlantic Canada. There's an amazing painting behind me that was made by Dr. Nicholas Mursovsky, who was one of the early sea turtle um, scientists from Canada, uh, one of the only ones from Canada actually of a a leatherback on a beach in French Guiana. That's what's behind me. But they haul up on the nesting beaches, typically at night, um, the female turtles, the adult female turtles to lay their eggs. Um, and they'll lay between 80 and 100 eggs at a time. So they, they don't nest every year. They nest every two years. And then the years in which they're nesting, so their nesting years, they'll lay about eight, approximately eight nests. So they'll lay a, they'll lay a, a, a clutch of eggs. So between 80 and 100 eggs, They'll head back into the ocean for about 10 days, then they'll come back and lay the, another set of eggs, and then they'll go back into the ocean. So they do this kind of internesting stuff. And about 60 days later, little hatchling turtles erupt from the nest. So the mother turtle lays the eggs, she buries them in the sand, and then she takes off and she never sees those babies again that we know of. And then the babies incubate in their, in their nest. Um, what's one of the really cool things about turtles and, and about leatherbacks is whether or not they're... Uh, their female turtles or male turtles depends on the temperature of the nest. So if you think about digging a big hole in the sand, you know that kind of when you get to the very bottom of the hole, if you're digging it deep enough, so leatherbacks nests are, my hands are off the screen, but leatherback nests are about, um, they're about at least a foot deep. Um, when you think about it, if you dig that deep, you, you know that the, the sand near the bottom of that hole is usually a bit cooler than the sand would be at the top, which is being heated by the sun, right? So if you were to fill it back in again. So what happens is the cooler kind of temperatures, which are usually at the bottom of the nest, are male turtles and tend to be male turtles. In the middle where it's cold and warm, you can get a mix of females and males. And then at the top of the nest where it's warmer for sure, you often get female turtles. So it's it ends up kind of splitting the, the sexes be, be, between male and female. It's, it's not 50-50, it's not but... Um, it gets you a, a kind of a decent um, sex ratio of turtles as a result. So that's a really cool thing about sea turtles. It's a bit worrisome in a world where there's climate change and global warming. And we see um, we're seeing more and more female turtles coming out of nests and fewer and fewer males, because of course it's the, the, the earth is just warmer in some, and particularly we're seeing this in some places like Australia right now. When baby turtles are born, they are tiny. Um, and they can fit in the palm of your hand, little leatherbacks, and they weigh as much as typically they weigh as much as a Kit Kat bar. So the next time you're holding a Kit Kat bar, imagine that, and then imagine how big they end up getting. It's just incredible the growth curve that they have. I'm sorry, I went backwards. Um, so they come out of their nests and then they head, they erupt from the nest. So they all kind of scramble up around the same time and they get out of their eggs and they, um, they head to the ocean um, where they then enter the ocean. And you've probably seen this before um, in movies and stuff, which is this great scramble over the sand into the water. And I'm going to show you, this is what you're seeing in the screen here is something called, um, there's it's, sargassum, which is like a seaweed that's on the on the sand there. And right now we're having a lot of trouble with huge mats of sargassum that are like two or three feet deep blanketing these these beaches, which has really been an issue in terms of turtles being allowed to, or being able to lay their eggs at all, um, let alone hatchlings coming out of it. And you can see here this little hatchling, um, which I'm going to show you. This is a beach in Trinidad. This story. So listen, this well, you'll see there's this, and then there's at the very end, you're going to see what happened here. But this little guy is pretty amazing. But if you see how he has to struggle to get over the sargassum, you can see why having kind of increased amounts of sargassum is difficult for these guys. But he came out of his nest and he's like, oh no. And heads all the way into the ocean. And it's a long trip. Until he finally gets there, or she. This is what happened to a lot of the nests though. These are vultures. And what they did, I was down the beach when I first, so you see what they did? When I first, it's kind of a sad photo to end on, but when I first, someone first yelled, the turtles are hatching. And I had never seen hatchling turtles before because when we work with leatherbacks, we're working with them on the in the water. With turtles, leatherback turtles, sea turtles never nest in Canada. They only nest in the tropics. They'll never come onto land here, typically alive at all, very rarely alive. And if they're alive, they're usually pretty sick or something's very, very wrong. Um, so that we never get to see little tiny hatchling turtles. We only ever see the, the sub-adults and the adult turtles here. So I was so thrilled. I was running down the beach and then we could see those vultures, which I showed you circling the nest. And within was, it was by the time we got there, they had had cleared most of the, the little turtles. I'd eaten most of them. They take one of the, the, um, 
they take off one of their, their um, flippers and they just suck the insides out. So we saw like, well, just dozens and dozens of these little tiny dead leather bags, which is very sad. So I was super excited about the one that, that got away um, or the few that got away. There are several, but we don't worry about, I mean, leatherbacks are an endangered species. We don't worry about things like vultures eating leatherbacks because that's natural predation. That's what nature is doing to, to kind of control its own and, and work out its own, um, the way its own process is. We don't worry so much about that. I mean, it was disappointing, but um, it's not a major concern when we're looking at threats to animals. I was actually amazed at the efficiencies of the vultures. It says something about vultures that they could do what they did in such a short time, even with all of us kind of yelling, go away. Um, so leatherbacks start their lives on the, on the nesting beaches. So that was in a place called Trinidad, which is a country just to the north um, east of the, the kind of the northeast tip of South America. Um, and then we find them in the coast uh, off the coast of Atlantic Canada. So they go on these huge migrations every year, all the way up to, to, uh, to Atlantic Canadian waters, where we learned about them largely because Sherman Blakeney had had this idea in the 1960s. We came in the late 1990s to uh, Nova Scotia and had heard of this work of his, like these ideas that had kind of lain dormant for 30 years. Um, but people were starting to talk about seeing leatherbacks again. And so the question was, do these animals actually come to Canadian waters? And if so, why? So scientists had said, if they come here, they're lost. They're not, they're not meant to be in, in Canadian waters or, or what we call temperate waters, um, which may be a word you're familiar with. So cooler waters, cooler ocean waters. Um, they're not, you know, if they're there, they're there by mistake, which is in retrospect. I mean, now we know that they scientists were wrong, but in retrospect, it's kind of a funny thing to say. I mean, I don't think animals get lost. Humans get lost, but I think animals pretty much usually know where they are, you know? So anyway, we wanted to find out if people were seeing these leatherback turtles at sea and the, the best people we could think to ask were commercial fishermen because they spend so much time on the water. So we wanted to talk to them and say, have you seen this turtle? So we went around the coast of Nova Scotia, which we still do today, to every fishing wharf. And we put up a sign that said, have you seen the turtle? And the picture that you see on the left is the poster that we put up the very first year. And then the picture on the right is it kind of jazzed up and simplified a little bit, um, which is the one that we currently use. And the main thing was, here are the things you can do if you see a turtle. Please tell us about it. Call us, um, write, you know, write down the latitude and longitude so we can find out the coordinates of where that animal was. So we can start to understand how they use the ocean, where they are, how often they're here, what time of year they're here. Do you see more of them in July, more of them in June? What, what to get a sense of that information? Because we just didn't know. Um, and what we discovered, so there had been 70 sightings of, or 72 sightings of leatherback turtles in the entire history of Atlantic Canada until 19, the summer of 1998 just set like that was it all of history all of recorded history obviously um and then in one summer with the help of commercial fishermen we had more than 171 sightings of leatherback turtles and so what they did and what i think is one of the most remarkable scientific stories anywhere and certainly in canada um, was they changed the global understanding of a dinosaur and that to me is just a miracle just just such an amazing thing because they did what was in front of them you know we look at this world and you guys probably think about this quite a bit you look at this world that we have, which is so confusing these days with all the things going on and particularly all the issues with climate. Um, and we look at things like I studied the work that April and I do with sea turtles that are endangered and there's not a ton of great news in that respect. Um, but what I'm always reminded of with the story of the fisherman is that you do the thing that's in front of you, right? That you, if, if somebody set, put up a poster and said, hey, if you see this turtle, can you give me a call? And you do, when you call in that sighting, what you might not know is that hundred other people are calling them in too, or 150 other people are calling them in too. And by the collection of all of that, those single individual actions, just in the middle of your workplace, just took a minute, wasn't really a big deal, didn't think they were changing the world, um, that collectively they certainly did. And they really rewrote, I mean, leatherbacks have been around for, you know, like I said, since the time of, you know, before the time of the dinosaurs, this is, they, they rewrote a huge piece of, of our understanding of the natural history of the world, right? So just by picking up the phone and doing the thing they could do, and it wasn't like all of them were sitting there with, you know, having studied biology their whole life or conservation science or any of those things. They just were out and they did the thing in front of them. And I think that's such a powerful message to all of us, right? You don't have to have some big giant agenda or do some huge thing. You just have to do all the little ones that you find, right? So this is a map that shows all those little yellow dots are places where people had seen leatherbacks. Um, and, uh, you know, this is interesting because it tells you both where the turtles are and where the humans are, right? Because if it's a sighting, someone's had to see it. So what it shows you is where humans and leatherbacks kind of um, met up. So in the, in, the, in the water. So what we wanted to be able to do was to let the turtles tell us where they went because we wanted to figure out 
because what we, we call biases in science. So what are the things that kind of affect how the information or the data that we're collecting? So the thing that affected that data was who was collecting it, where were they? You know, it was it was determined by what people were fishing, what the season was, what the weather was like, all those kinds of things. But we wanted the turtles to be able to tell us exactly where they were going. So um, Mike James, again, who you saw in that earlier photo, he's the guy in the front of the boat there with the big hoop, um, decided he was going to try and do some work satellite tagging um, leatherback turtles. So putting a satellite tag and attaching it to their shell so that they could then learn from the satellite exactly where um, the turtle went in the ocean. And other things you could study depth, like how long the turtle dived, what types of dives they were doing, all those types of things, what the water temperature was like, how much salt was in the water around them, trying to get all the kind of information that we could find on them. And so we did it kind of like you would catch a giant butterfly, right? It was creating this big net and then um, went out. We always work with commercial fishermen ever since the very beginning of this project. They've been our field assistants. They've been the people that have helped us develop our equipment. Um, they've been just the most amazing, amazing scientific partners we could ever ask for. And, and, and just have really, again, changed uh, this huge area of science. So we go out and we try and catch a turtle. And then when we do, we bring it onto a platform in the back of the boat. And April's certainly been involved in all of this. Um, and we put a satellite transmitter on it. And I'm going to just show you what that looks like as well. This, just so you can see it kind of in relation to me, is a little, this is what the satellite transmitter looks like. This is actually a actual transmitter that was on the back of a leatherback turtle that we put on um, in Nova Scotia that then the turtle went all the way to Colombia in South America. And, um, and then our colleagues, our friends on the nesting beaches there took the tag off of the turtle so that we could get it back. And, and inside, buried inside here, there's a computer and there's a, most of the space is taking up with batteries. And now they're getting a little smaller even than this one. Um, but there's a lot of this, I don't know if you can see on the bottom that's filled with batteries. Um, but um, there's also information on those computers that, that if you can get the tag back, you get way more information than what the satellite can, can um, collect, but you can just get a chance to see what that looks like. So yeah, this tag was on the back of a turtle called Red Rocket. And this you can see is a return migration of a leatherback. So no one had ever kind of seen this before. Nobody knew again that turtles were up in Nova Scotia at all, let alone that they were doing these huge long migrations all the way from the top to the, to the bottom here. And I'm hoping everyone can see that. I'm not sure if the way this is is blocking it there. Um, you can see that they started off in, uh, we captured it just off the south coast of, or southwestern shore of Nova Scotia. They went up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, all the way down um, to South America, Central America, hung out in Trinidad and came all the way back up. And that was, this is one of the very first tracks of a, a return migration tracks of a leatherback turtle um, ever recorded. Sorry, there we go. So then we kept satellite tag satellite tagging turtles. And what we found, so the, the scientists who finally agreed that leatherbacks would be coming to Canadian waters said, well, if they're coming to Canadian waters, they're coming up the Gulf Stream, which is that kind of warm current of air that flows along the, the coast of North America and out past Newfoundland. And um, they said they'll be using that because it's warmer water, so that would make sense. And it's what they wanted to call a migratory corridor. So that the idea was that the turtles would all use this migratory corridor to come up to Nova Scotia. Um, and so if they were consistent in this corridor, we could then protect it, almost like a marine protected area. Um, so this was the idea. And then we started getting our satellite tracks back. And what we found was actually... They don't use a migratory corridor. Leatherbacks are the worst species when it comes to something like a marine protected area as trying to be a conservation measure because they don't stay in one spot. In fact, they look like just a spaghetti, mass of spaghetti tossed against a wall um, in terms of how they use the ocean. Each of these red lines is an individual track of a, of a turtle that we satellite tagged. And you can see they make use of the entire ocean, which makes them challenging to conserve because it would be nice if we could just kind of Cordon, cordon off a piece of the ocean and say, don't come here, then keep them safe. But that's not, that's not how it works with leatherbacks. I think it's amazing. I love, I love that they're kind of random, you know, like that you'll just see, like, I don't know if you can see here, this track, like instead of going south, this turtle decided she was going to go east. Like they just, they, they always, they never fail to surprise me. They never fail when we think we've had, oh, we've had a hundred turtles. They all did this. There's always another one that does something completely different. And then you're like, oh, <laughs> didn't occur to me that the turtle might decide to do that. So I love that they are not quite so predictable. I think that's really a very fascinating thing about them. And I think it's something that helps actually keep them safe too, because I think, um, you know, humans, when we think we can control something, we don't always make the best decisions. So. 
So when they're in um, South America, we do work with um, colleagues down there as well. This is working with some very good and old friends of ours, uh, the Nature Seekers, which is a, a, an organization, a conservation organization that works um, on Matura Beach in Trinidad, the largest nesting beach for leatherback turtles or one of the largest nesting beaches for leatherback turtles in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and so what we wanted to do is to work with them to satellite tag Canadian turtles so they could find that, um, one of the things we do in, in addition to, I'm just gonna do this, in addition to um, putting a satellite tag on turtles is we do something really simple, which is we put just a flipper tag on the turtle, which is just a little tiny tag. It's like the kind you might see on the ear of a cow. And it has just like Canada 317 in this case on one side. And then it has actually the Museum of Natural History address on the other side. So if someone were to find this tag that we knew the museum would always be around that they'd be able to, to find um, us ultimately and um, be able to report that that tag uh, had been found. So when they find the tag on turtles in Trinidad, for example, so when the turtle comes from Canada all the way to Trinidad, they know that it's a Canadian turtle and other nesting groups do this as well. So we wanted to learn um, there what the turtles, the Canadian turtles were doing when they left the nesting beach. So we did more satellite tag work there. And you can see we put tags on turtles on the nesting beach and then watch them come all the way back up to Canada um, That's that uh, for that summer. Um, what are the leatherbacks doing in Canadian waters? They're feeding on jellyfish. They grow to be this the huge from from something that, that weighs as much as a Kit Kat bar to something that weighs over a thousand pounds, feeding exclusively on jellyfish or so kind of uh, similar kind of soft body things, but largely jellyfish. And, and when we find them up here, they're they're eating moon jellyfish, which are those little clear kind of white jellyfish, or they're eating these these big big huge lion's mane jellyfish. And you can see these are pictures. This is a picture. This is a picture that that um, National Geographic magazine came and did some did a piece on our work years ago. And this was one of the um, photographs by Brian Scarry, who's just one of the most amazing underwater photographers uh, working in the world. Um, and then this is one, which is also an amazing photograph for a different reason. It was taken by one of the fishermen we work with um, and was one of the really earliest pictures we ever had of a giant lion's mane jellyfish where we started to understand just how big they get in Nova Scotia. In fact, we did some work at one point, we had colleagues in Florida who were doing, wanted to study the jellyfish that leatherbacks were eating. And so we collected, I think April, where you were there for this, we collected a giant jellyfish. We, the leatherback had been feeding it. We grabbed it, we picked it up and it filled a 50 pound bait box. And then I had to ship it to Florida. And so we put it on dry ice. It was a 50 pound jellyfish. We put it on dry ice into a, in a big box and the FedEx guy came to my office. He's like, what, what's in this box? I was like, it contains a 50 pound jellyfish. Anyway, that's what the leatherback turtles are eating and feeding on here. And one of the coolest things about them, well, well, there are a bunch of cool things. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is what the inside of a leatherback's mouth looks like. And this is one of the cool things about eating jellyfish if you're a leatherback is that you don't have teeth. Instead, what you have are something called esophageal spines. So there's spines that, that line your esophagus all the way down into your stomach. And they're phenomenal. And I'm going to just give you a quick look at them. This is a piece of it. And so you can see how cool this is. There are big, long pieces of spine and then little tinier kind of sharp spines in there. So there's like big coarse cutting spines and then little tiny spines that eat up whatever else is in there or that, that shred up whatever else is in there. They face downward. So once the jellyfish goes down the throat of the leatherback, it's impossible for it to come back out again. And they're actually extremely sharp even now. Um, they're problematic when a turtle eats something like a piece of plastic, right? Because what happens if you're eating a jellyfish, which is an organic material, the jellyfish, even if it gets caught in all these little tiny um, spines breaks down, right? Because it's organic, plastic doesn't. And so even if it doesn't have a big piece of plastic, it'll get a little piece and it can get lodged in there. And then what happens is more and more plastic, if they get it also kind of gets lodged in, you know, it becomes a, an obstruction for the turtle. But this is really one of the most remarkable things about leatherbacks and so unexpected, right? You don't expect someone's throat to look like that. And what we wanted to be able to do, so is to figure out what people didn't know. We had a sense that leatherbacks fed on jellyfish, but we didn't know um, how many jellyfish they ate, what it, how many jellyfish it took to feed a leatherback, um, generally how big they were, the, even the jellyfish species and things like that, how often they were eating. And so we developed this camera, Mike James again developed this camera, um, and it's a critter cam to watch the turtle eating. So I'm gonna show you some of the coolest footage. This is a jellyfish. 
And this is the top of a turtle's head. And you can see it and you see there's this pink spot and it's eating the, it's eating the jellyfish. And all the jellyfish gore coming off of it. And then you can see another jellyfish coming up in the, in the distance there. And I love watching the turtles because they start to chew really fast when they come up on another jellyfish. You can see all the bits of jellyfish coming off of it. If you love jellyfish, this would be painful to watch, honestly, but. And see, there's another one coming. And then watch how it just keeps chewing as fast as it can because it's like, oh my gosh, yum, 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 yum. <laughs> because it doesn't want to miss any of them. And so what we found is that it's almost like a conveyor belt of jellyfish down there deep in the ocean. Um, we couldn't see all these jellyfish on the surface of the water, but deep in the ocean, the leatherbacks are down there just eating one jellyfish after another. And so what's interesting, if we remember that shell again, that, that flexible shell. So this is a leatherback turtle on a nesting beach. And you can see, I mean, to me, it looks skinny, <laughs> but you can see it's not, I suppose, by most standards, but you can see those really deep ridges, those seven ridges we talked about. And this is the same turtle. So this is the same turtle um, on our field boat. And that eats, what they do is they feed so heavily on jellyfish while they're here. We learned by watching hours and hours of the video, like the one I just showed you, that they'll eat approximately their body weight in jellyfish every day. So they're sucking, you know, 900, 800 pounds of jellyfish out of the ocean, out of Atlantic Canada. Um, you're welcome for people who like to swim on the beaches around here, um, out of the ocean per day per turtle. And they're getting fat, fat, fat. Um, in fact, you can kind of see how late, how long they've been here. You can guess how long they've been here, but kind of how big and fat they are. Um, but if you think of that flexible shell again, you can see that the shell allows it to expand to get really, really fat on jellyfish here. And then it kind of can, it's, we look, think of it almost like it's pleated, right? Like then it can get, um, when they, when they get thinner again, the shell can, can then relax again. So it's pretty, pretty neat. Oh, here, I'll just show you. Sorry, you can see too, sorry, the fat. So leatherbacks, sea turtles don't pull their heads in like other turtles do. They're not able to do that. But even if they could, um, which they can't, the, the amount of fat around the heads of these turtles is extraordinary. Um, certainly by the end of the summer, um, it's they're really, really big. And that's just a picture of a leatherback on a nesting beach. Um... And I'm just going to see, I want to just show you a couple of more things just quickly, um, and then I'll, I'll finish up. These are some of the things we were talking briefly about plastics. One of the things people talk about is what can I do to help sea turtles? And sometimes it's hard because they're so far offshore, right? That you don't actually get to interact with them in Canada in the same way you do in other places. Although we do ask people to help us walk the beaches in the, in the fall and the, uh, until usually the end of January, looking for the little tiny sea turtles that sometimes get washed up. Um, which are those green turtles and those Kemp's Ridleys I talked to you about before. Uh, but for the most part with leatherbacks, we don't get a lot of hands-on experience um, other than on the field boat. But we do talk about eliminating plastic waste if we can, which is terrible for all, you know, most all, all of nature basically. Um, but just to show you, we have pulled plastic out of leatherbacks before. So this was found in the, in the stomach of a leatherback that had died. Um, it wasn't the cause of death, but it was there too, which is just a lid from a plastic can. Um, it's from a jar. And then this, again, I think April was there, this um, leatherback pooped out while we were <laughs> working with it, which is just a big piece of black plastic bag. It started to poop it out while we were working it. So we, we pulled it out gently from the end, but that's a big piece of plastic that it was working through its body. So um, we do see them in turtles. We don't see it kind of, we don't see tons of it. We haven't started sc uh, screening for microplastics at the moment, just because we don't, um, it's, we're dealing with a number of other things and there's limited capacity in terms of, of what we can do in all of the necropsies that we do. But um, it's just to say that that's, we do see it in turtles. So, I mean, as I'm sure all of you do anyway, is just keep it out of the ocean. Did anybody have questions or, or other things you wanted to ask? But, oh, and I've got one other tiny thing. Do you remember when I showed you the giant? Okay, let's just keep this in mind one second. This guy in terms of size, which is, this is actually the molds that was done, a man called Doug Morris made it, who's just the most, just a magician of an artist uh, um, in Grand Pre in Nova Scotia. He's just phenomenal. Um, anyway, this is the head. There's more of a body to other players, but it's to scale. It was taken. It was a mold that was made from a leatherback that had died off of Cape Breton. And we call, um, we call her Annie. 
Um, and this is a Kemp's Ridley, the little tiny turtles that we find. This is the size of its skull, the little baby skull. So I just wanted to show you in relation to uh, the size of a leatherback, how much smaller those other hard shelled sea turtles. Now this is a, a, a what we would call a juvenile, a little tiny, um, one of the Kemp's anyway, just a little, you know, probably six or seven years old, this little guy, but uh, even still, still so super tiny, but you still get that really cool set up with the lacrimal glands right back there and the little tiny brain. I love this. I think it's so beautiful, this skull. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Kathleen. Everything you said was so cool. I have a lot of questions. Uh, so folks, this is the best time to ask questions because we have Kathleen trapped here. So go ahead, stick any questions, comments you have for her in the chat. Uh, I'll get us started though, because I have a long list that I've been writing here. I, I have so many questions, maybe I should organize them somehow. So. Maybe I have a lot of questions about physiology. I'm okay. wondering why, I, obviously leatherback turtles are huge and that's kind of like, if there's a quintessential Nova Scotian turtle, then that must be it. So why are they so big and are bigger turtles more cold hardy and why is that? So I don't know why they are kind of programmed to grow as big as they do, but it's a huge advantage to them. So partially why they do so well in cold water is they have, they're, gigantic, right? So there's something called gigantothermy, which is why bigger things are warmer. So if you think of putting a little tiny baby out in a cold day versus putting a, you know, a big grown, large grown adult, um, the adult's going to stay warmer longer than the little tiny baby, right? So um, once you're, you're bigger, you tend to stay warmer. But beyond that, leatherbacks are amazing in that they have something called countercurrent heat exchange that takes place in their body. So they, their arteries and their veins are bundled together. And so you know that the warm blood from your heart goes away, it goes, uh, goes to your extremities, through your arteries and comes back through the veins. Sorry. I was just like, and which one is that? I always have to remember. Um, but when you, when you put them together, when they're bound together, the warm blood keeps the cooler blood that's returning to your, to the heart warmer at a more consistent, at a more consistent temperature. So actually turtles function a little bit like, like mammals a little bit, um, in that they can keep their body temperature higher than the temperature of the ambient water temperature around them, the, the area or the water around them. So typically reptiles are, are, excuse me, ectotherms, which means that their body heat matches the heat or the cold around it, the, 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 the temperature of the um, environment that they're in. But even though they're ectotherms, because of these other kind of physiological um, advantages or adaptations, they can stay a bit warmer, which means that they do better in colder temperatures, which is why we find them here and why we have trouble with these little tiny turtles um, when um, they get caught in cold water. And what we see is that they become hypothermic. So the little Kemp's Ridleys and the little green turtles become hypothermic and um, become, often they'll get pneumonia or they'll just become lethargic because they're so cold. If, if they, they come up and kind of towards off in the Bay of Fundy or Southwest Nova Scotia, although sometimes randomly in the Gulf of St. Lawrence too, um, they'll get caught in, in, they'll be in kind of a warm current, which will break apart suddenly because of a storm or just because of oceanographic processes and they get cold very quickly. And then they, they end up um, dying a lot of the time, unless we find them early enough, um, which is why people walk the beaches kind of looking for them because they just aren't big enough to manage those extreme changes in temperature. Wow. The leatherbacks are really like dinosaurs. They're tough men. Uh, cool. I'm also wondering about the leatherbacks holding their breath for so long. So you said that leatherbacks can hold their breath for over an hour underwater. How is that possible when he, I mean, I don't know how breathing is even possible, but humans can't hold their breath for more than a couple minutes. So what is it that allows them to do that? I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure. April, do you know what they can do that? No, I've never actually thought about why. <laughs> I just know that I'm just like, oh, they can. Um, and I'm sure even longer, I don't know. So they breathe air like the rest of us, right? I mean, the problem, one of the huge issues, and I didn't talk actually about threats to these animals. I was just thinking of kind of introducing the species, but they're endangered, right? Endangered everywhere they're found, leatherback turtles, uh, critically endangered in the Pacific um, where there's the population is really in, in, in deep trouble and also seriously endangered here in the Atlantic. I mean, they're um, declining at a rate of about seven and a half, eight percent a year, year over year. So it's 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 not a great scene. Um, and one of the issues for them is when they become accidentally entangled in fishing gear, they can get entangled at the surface of the water and they're really strong. So they can kind of keep themselves up and they can breathe air and they can do all that other stuff while they're just sort of waiting to be released from fishing gear from a fish by a fisherman if they don't get too entangled. Um, 
but what happens is if the tide goes up and they're entangled, they can't, they can't like, they can't stay forever underwater. They don't breathe underwater. Right. Um, and so they drown. And so that's a big issue for them is drowning. Um, but they, they're lucky they can breathe as, or, you know, they, they, they're given a better chance because they can hold their breath for that long. I'm assuming it's because they have to dive to such great depths. Right. Um, you see these really deep, deep dives every now and again. So, um, I'm assuming it's, you know, partially kind of looking for food or figuring out what's in the water column and things like that. Yeah, so neat. I'm gonna have to Google physiology of like turtle lungs or something. Super yeah. interesting. Um, what are what are the main threats to these leatherbacks then, or what are threats that you think are maybe yeah. emerging threats in Nova Scotia? What things should we really be concerned about? The largest threat is accidental entanglement in fishing gear, right? Well, up here in, in kind of the North Atlantic, that's the biggest issue, um, which is why it's so great that we work with commercial fishermen, right? So you can be the person that's the largest threat to the animal, and at the same time, that makes you the animal's greatest hope, right? So the more fishermen that are engaged in disentangling turtles um, correctly, the more turtle fishermen that are uh, engaged in, in um, preparing their gear in such a way as to not entangle them in the first place, that's a huge uh, benefit to leatherbacks in Canada and Canadian waters, but there are entanglement issues that take place, you know, globally. So the types of gear that they fish off of Trinidad, for example, we get um, fishermen who tell us they're drowning eight and nine leatherbacks a day down there um, because they use a gillnet fishery, which is a different type of fishery, right? Which are these, just these great big, long, huge expanses, just of uh, like a curtain of net, right? And the turtles get entangled in it and, and drown before the fishermen get to pull in that part of the net. Right. So um, there are huge issues that way. There's some some other issues in different parts of the world in terms of how they fish different types of gears. So that's an issue. There's a lot of issues down on the on the nesting. Beach. So we also have plastic as an issue. I don't think plastic we don't see plastic as a huge mortality risk for leatherbacks, but it compromises them. Right. So just say you survive eating the plastic, but maybe you can't reproduce in the same way. Maybe you get tired faster and can't you know, your stomach can't obviously hold as much if it's filled with plastic. It can't hold as much pr proper nutrition. So it compromises your ability to survive. Um, the issue with, um, on the, the issues on the nesting beaches are really, uh, problematic. So leatherbacks lay their eggs on the, on, on the beach, as we were saying, and then they leave them. And so those nests are available for people who like to poach them. So people who like to dig up the nests and use the eggs. So people use them for food. They're really popular on the black market. Um, they sell for like a dollar American per egg. Um, so there's a, a lot of money to be made from them. So there's issues with poaching of, of nests and also poaching of nesting females where they'll kill the turtle while she's nesting. Um, I've heard of people using the meat to eat and I've heard of people using the meat to make dog food. Um, so there's just a variety of uses for, for dead leatherbacks. Um, it's illegal to do that, but there are people who do that. Um, there's a lot of trade in sea turtle parts. So other types of sea turtles, they'll trade in their shells, for example, but often usually it's the eggs and in some cases, the meat. Climate change is a real issue for them. So again, we have this kind of warming temperature of the of the earth. So we've got this question about what does that mean about um, more eggs being girls than or fe uh, female eggs than male eggs? So what does that mean for being able to have as a species to survive the way it survived in the past? Um, that's a bit of a concern in some areas specifically. Um, also more storms, right? And we see that even in Nova Scotia, these it feels like every kind of weather event is a huge dramatic event, right? So on the on the beaches, when you're having huge hurricanes or or, or even just giant kind of storms where there's a um, the waves are really, really strong or really persistent. Um, you wash out turtle nest, nests, you wash out beaches, you wash out, which is habitat. Um, and those beaches are sometimes, well, usually are incredibly beautiful. And so people build condominiums on them. Um, and there's a ton of tourism that takes place, which means that one of the interesting things about little hatchlings is that they're really sensitive to light. And so are female nesting female turtles. If there's a nesting female turtle and she's approaching the nesting beach and there's a bright light on that beach, she'll turn around, she won't nest. She'll only nest in the dark. Um, and if you're a hatchling turtle and you, and you come out of your nest, typically you'd be doing that at night. And what you're looking for is the brightest spot that you can find. You go towards the light, which should be the moon, right? It should be the moon kind of shimmering on the water for the most part, or the water is often brighter if you think about how it reflects whatever lights around. And so the leather, the hatchlings are kind of programmed to go towards the light. But if you have a, a beachfront property with all kinds of lights on it, I've seen them myself in, in Trinidad, for example, where they go and they head directly into the neighborhood beside them. Um, and they die either of things like increased predation or they become uh, dehydrated, they, they become exhausted um, and they never make it into the ocean. So there are all kinds of different issues facing them. They're pretty complicated and it's hard because there are places where they nest where people are really hungry. So it's it's this kind of socioeconomic question too about what do you do if part of partially eating turtles is what's keeping your family alive? So how do we manage allowing people to kind of do traditional types of 
of hunting, if you will, um, when you've got an endangered species, but then you also have a population that in some cases, um, I'm thinking of places that what's going on in some areas of Venezuela right now where people are just starving, right? So it's it's very complicated. One of the best things that we've found to help conserve sea turtles is to do ecotourists, right? To get tourists down to the nesting beaches to, to see the turtles and to marvel at those turtles, because then the turtles become, as the tourists pay for those um, eco tours, the turtles become more valuable alive than dead. And that's been one of the most important conservation measures that have taken place for, for leatherbacks, uh, or, well, all nesting sea turtles, is turning them into a tourist attraction to try and make human beings like them uh, enough not to kill them. <laughs> wow. Hard being a turtle. Oh, my God. It's complicated. It's endangered species are really complicated. Conservation is so complicated because it's never just, is it a good thing to keep it alive or is it a bad thing? You know what I mean? Like it's never just a clear right or wrong, right? I think about this with plastic. I was just washing out my kids' lunch stuff um, and we send them with reusable plastic containers. And I think to myself, God, it's still more plastic, but I use it in some ways and it's great. In other ways, I wish there was none of it in the world. You know what I mean? Like you're always trying to, to balance, you know, it's really tricky. These answers are always really complex. Yeah, big topic I'm too. gonna add to that too. Oh yeah. Um, to me, one of the uh, most interesting facts that I've ever learned about the leatherbacks is that they don't have a reverse. So oh yeah. Most most turtles kind of, if you swim into a net, they can kind of back away. Whereas leatherbacks can only go forward. So if they ever go into nets, they can't back away from them because they only have one gear. Yeah, really, really good point, April. Thank you. Yeah, That's out of so 150 cute. million years of evolution, and they just never figured out reverse leatherbacks. <laughs> it's really cute to imagine, like, a T-Rex not knowing how to turn around. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I have some questions about um, migration and where turtles are. Um, I'm wondering why straight across the ocean? So that map that you brought up, why are the turtles moving kind of along the coast like we see some birds migrating is it because that's where the gulf stream is or yeah what's up with that really direct path it's really not clear <laughs> good question <laughs> yeah it's really not clear i mean it's if it weren't so spread like if it wasn't like that some turtles go way almost right to the coast of west africa and some other ones don't like it's just not entirely clear I ha we have to presume it's prey based so uh, probably current based as well but but prey based to a degree like if they I mean we what we see is they feed off the coast of Nova Scotia and oh, it will, Atlantic Canada it's a major feeding area for them it's where they get most of their energy for the year and then they go and we mostly see them kind of in transit all the way down until they get back off the nesting beach area where they start to eat again um, and do lots of feeding they don't feed a lot in the in the interim so it's not really clear if it's just like maybe there's some jellyfish along the way or what's going on there but but we really don't have a great answer for that at this stage you have to become a scientist and find out. I, you know, what's interesting though, and I, I didn't have that slide in here, but I, I now I wish I did was we, we, what we've seen. So when I showed you a slide of just the turtles coming up from Trinidad up to Nova Scotia. And so what was interesting about those is we have one of the turtles is called Suzanne and she goes up to Nova Scotia along a particular path. And then she comes back to Trinidad two years later and they find her and they take her tag off and they put a new tag on her to see what she continues to do to try and get an idea of what she does over time. And if you look at the track of the second one, she almost follows exactly the same trajectory up the ocean. Like you can almost lay them one on top of the other and they're almost identical. Um, so they're responding to something specific. I just don't know what it is. Interesting. Like when you think of the breadth of the ocean, right? Like when you think of like how like featureless, right? I mean, to us, right? A featureless ocean. I mean, how does she figure out to go pretty much like within a kilometer. You know, we see this too when one of those return migrations on a male turtle, he came off the coast of, uh, was like, I remember this so clearly, he came off the coast of Trinidad to, to while well, the other turtles were nesting, they mate down there. And then two years, or the next year, within the same week, was in precisely the same spot. Like it was like March 3rd and March 5th. Like it's just, it's, there's some sense of directionality and time that is built into that little tiny brain. That's just incredible, right? So cool. Uh, it sounds like the um, so the adults that you guys are working with and other researchers have, have worked with, you're doing a lot of autopsies to figure out what's happened to dead turtles. How do you tell when you have a jellyfish in a stomach? Or how can you really tell anything, I guess, in a stomach content analysis when jellyfish are kind of just watery blobs? <laughs> Well, you can see it. Like usually when you, it depends on the state of 
like decomposition, obviously it depends on a number of different things, but you cut it open and you can like see the jellyfish, like mushy jellyfish, bits of jellyfish and you can identify what it is. Oh, neat. Yeah. Uh, are you aware of any work done to incorporate Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge on leatherback presence in Nova Scotia or? We've had, we've, we've had actually some work we, we have, I mean, we've worked, we work with, and uh, we have worked in the past with uh, members of the, um, the First Nations fisheries. So they've helped do some work for us just in terms of looking for sea turtles. And we talked to them about sea turtles and helping with um, some of like collecting some of the dead sea turtles that they found. Um, and then also looking at um, helping with particularly loggerhead work that we were doing offshore. Um, and there's been some sightings like in Northern Labrador um, in a community called Maine, um, older sightings of leatherbacks. But for the most part, um, it's the leatherbacks are found further offshore than mostly humans would go. So it wasn't as prevalent in terms of, of their experience of Nova Scotia in terms of just from what we've learned so far from First Nations people. Um, it wasn't it, within the trajectory of kind of what they're normal, like you're not going to access it as a human being. Typically, you might be lucky enough to see one if you're kayaking offshore, but for the most part, it's, you know, four or five kilometers off. So that wasn't where a lot of the traditional fishing was taking place, right? Hmm. All right, guys. Well. We're right on the hour here, so we better get into trivia. Um, Kathleen and April, if you have time and want to stick around and throw in any other cool facts to our trivia here, we can get that started. Um, so folks, if you are going to play trivia via Kahoot, go back up to the top of the chat there where you can find that code. It is 7961871. You can stick that right into the app and get into our Kahoot game. I see from our viewer list here that we have just seven families participating. So your odds are pretty good uh, of winning. And that's great because we have a prize package for you today. So Kathleen has graciously provided us with some turtly awesome stuff. And I have a couple other things for you as well. So how this is going to work is um, whether you go through trivia on Kahoot or if you want to play old school with pen and paper at the end of trivia. You're going to send me either your Kahoot name or your answers, a scan or a picture is fine of whatever you wrote down at home. And then we're going to put you into a draw for our prize package here and we'll mail it out to you. So make sure these are your mailing address as well. I'll make sure that our email is in the chat there so you have that. I'll give you a second to sign into Kahoot for the folks that want to play on Kahoot. Now that I'm thinking about it, maybe your odds aren't that good if there's several members of the family participating on one screen tonight. We'll have to see. And how many tablets are at home, I guess. All right, so I'll give you just maybe a minute there to get going on Kahoot. To, uh, uh, if you want to go grab pen and paper, that's cool too. And their connections to them. We'll get started in a sec. Nature's just as awesome as it's always been. So we're just sort of facilitating that, that natural affinity. We have guest speakers and guest field trip leaders who come in. And so they share their passion with the kids. And it's just their enthusiasm is contagious. It's just the kids pick up on it and are really interested in it and often go on to want to learn more about it outside of the club. It gets us out all year round and we go to completely different places each time and it introduces us to a lot of different places and there's knowledgeable people with us so if we have questions about anything we can ask and if we want a place find out where to look up for information we can get that as well. So sort of the knowledge base and the variety of places we go to I think and the friends we go with we have great fun as well. The kids lead the way, so I think learning how to be in nature and how to get the most from it is useful. I like that it is geared towards families. Kids get something out of it, adults get something out of it. The kids need time in nature that's unstructured just for their own discovery, just to not have instructions about how they're supposed to be, and the club offers that every month. All of our events are on our website, and it's really informal, so you don't have to like sign up or pay or anything, so families just come to ones that work with their schedule and with their interest. So, you know, you might come because your kids are really into wildflowers or into sharks, but then I find um, people keep coming back whether they know the subject or not. Any of our memories from here will be always good ones and good ones in nature. And um, anything you learn on top of that is a bonus, really. <laughs> All right, guys, now we get into trivia here. If you find that there's too much of a lag, if you're not getting the questions in time or you don't have quick enough to answer on Kahoot, you can always move over to pen and paper. That's totally fine. I know that the online version doesn't always work for everyone. So, so no worries there. 
Great, we'll get started. All about Nova Scotia sea turtles. Three, two, one. Our first question is, the lining of a leatherback's throat contains, here are your options. Kathleen, you're gonna tell me how to say this. Is it esophageal? Yep. Okay, esophageal spines, esophageal spikes, esophageal teeth, or esophageal sharps? Yeah, esophageal spines, nice work guys. I think there's only a few people playing on Kahoot, so we're actually going to go pretty quick through these. Kathleen, is there any research done on how many spines turtles have or how big those spines are? Not that I'm aware of, no. They seem so big. I guess you have to break up a really big jellyfish. Yeah. All right. Number two. True or false? Sea turtles nest on sandy beaches in Nova Scotia. False. Yeah, you guys were listening. We get calls every year about turtles nesting. Really? We, yeah, because you know what's interesting, and, and I don't know if you guys already had know about this, but sometimes snapping turtles will hang out um, in the brackish water, sort of the water that's right kind of um, coming off, like that's part salty, part not salty, um, right along the coast, um, sometimes in little little um, estuaries and stuff. And so people will see the turtle coming out of the ocean and say, it's a sea turtle um, when it's a snapping turtle. And we oh, get calls every, every year, like multiple calls a summer. Cool. Well, you guys, Ooh, I got cut out there. You guys were listening. Yep. So Sandy Beaches, to the south, not Nova Scotia. They're eating up here in Nova Scotia. We are the buffet. Number three, the scientific name for a sea turtle's top shell is called, and this is the one on the top. So in our photo here, you can see a leatherback model and it's that top shell. Is it plastron, scute? Scute, is that how you say that? <laughs> I say scoot. 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 Oh my gosh, you guys are fast. Yeah, it is carabase. <laughs> Good listening. Nice work. Number four is true or false. Nest temperature determines whether a sea turtle will be female or male. That is true. Like I said, if this is going too fast for you guys, if the app is lagging, you can always go over to pen and paper. Number five, when a female turtle nests, she looks like she's crying. What she's really doing is getting rid of extra water, extra salt, extra sugar, or sand. Tears. We've got a head to head here between MW and Logan. Number six, true or false, leatherback turtles can dive deeper than a kilometer. It's true. That's really far. Mm -hmm. Think of how long it takes to run for a kilometer, you know? Oh my gosh, I'm so slow. Those turtles are impressive. Number seven, leatherbacks can hold their breath underwater for less than five minutes, over five hours, over one hour, less than 25 minutes. You guys had good listening ears today. One hour. You know what's neat about the kilometer thing, about diving deeper than a kilometer? I mean, that's as far as an instrument has recorded it. So someone had a scientific instrument on the back of that leather back that allowed them to record that, right? And so I wonder how much deeper they actually go, you know, the ones that just aren't monitored, you know? And then the other thing is, I'm always amazed that the ocean is that deep. I think that's really cool too. If you think about it, going 
that deep. Like it just keeps going and going and going. I think that's always amazing because you think of how long and, and kilometers, obviously not as deep as the ocean gets. And it's one of those things that I think is really conceptually so interesting to think about. Yeah, I suppose that's true of how long they can hold their breath too. Or do we have a good idea of how long they can hold their breath because of maybe fishery studies? No, it's just what it happens. It's kind of the information we have on these animals, considering they've been around for 150 million years, is very scant. <laughs> like we don't know a lot of very basic things about them. Like I couldn't tell you how long they live, leatherbacks. We don't know. No one knows that. So um because you can't keep them in captivity, because as April was saying, they go forward. You know, one of the interesting things is because they go ceaselessly forward, you can't keep them in an in an aquarium. Think about how powerful those flippers are. First of all, they get really big, but beyond that, they when they come to the wall of an aquarium, they don't stop swimming. They just keep bashing themselves against it um, because they can't go in reverse. So um, you can't raise them every time they die in an aquarium. So you can't raise them, raise them in captivity. And what you can do, other sea turtles you can, but not leatherbacks. And, and what you do when you raise things in captivity is you get a sense of how quickly they grow, even under artificial circumstances, how quickly they grow, how long they, they live um, as a captive animal. And we don't know any of that with leatherbacks. They're not really seen. It's called the lost years. They head into the ocean and then they disappear and people don't see them again until their carapaces are at about a meter long. And we don't know where they go or what they're doing. Other sea turtles, we've been able to kind of figure that out, but leatherbacks are just really a mystery. So there's a lot of really basic stuff. We don't, we don't have any idea about when it comes to leatherbacks. So it's, it's interesting that way. So what we know is only what someone's observed with an instrument. So if you put a, a transmitter on the back of a turtle and you, you happen to, that turtle happens to die for longer than an hour, then we can say finally, okay, I think it was 72 minutes or something is the longest uh, on record at the moment. And then that keeps getting written over depending on who who's tr whose instrument has lasted longer or happened to be on a turtle that liked to do deeper dives or stay under longer. Um, so it's it's going to take years before, because the instruments are relatively new, like the satellite tagging of leatherbacks is only 25 years old. So, so there isn't a ton of data out there. Like we have, I think, 100 and I can't remember 150 or something that we've done over the years, but that's the largest data set of track turtles on earth. So there just isn't a ton. If you think about how much we know about beavers, for example, or, you know, robins or things that we have thousands and tens of thousands of, of pieces of information on in terms of individual animals, um, leatherbacks is still really new. So, so we will take years and years and years before we have kind of more definitive answers to things like that. And it's just going to be by chance for the time being. It's kind of neat to be, like what I think is really cool is to be at the beginning, uh, like, and again, and, and I, and I, you know, for the person that had asked about, about the Mi'kmaq heritage too, this is talking about, about record traditionally recorded science, right? So of course there's uh, information, tons of information that exists on these animals um, in indigenous communities that's just been recorded in different ways, right? So when we're talking about kind of Western science recording of um, scientific recording methods, right? It's still relatively new. There's beautiful work done on sea turtles, um, beautiful art, beautiful um, traditional work done, particularly in South America where the turtles come to nest, right? Um, some amazing stuff that's done um, from an indigenous standpoint and understanding of the animals from an indigenous standpoint that's different. Um, we just don't see that the same stuff here in Nova Scotia, but again, the turtles aren't on land here. So you would see tons of that with, with freshwater turtles, of course, but, but not with other backs to the same extent, so. Mm -hmm. It's nice to know there's still some mysteries out there. So the science gets so much more accessible over time. So it's nice to know there's some cool research topics waiting for you guys when you get to the university level. For sure. We always say that too, when you're out looking for a turtle in a boat and you can go for like days and days and days and not find them. They're hard to find. They're endangered, right? And you're in the middle of a great big ocean. And uh, when you get those days where you don't see them, we're like, chalk one up for the turtles. You know, they got, they didn't, the humans didn't catch them today. You know, um, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> that's true i never thought of that <laughs> i mean it's bad for science but it's not bad for turtles <laughs> all right guys number eight true or false a sea turtle can pull its head into its shell to protect itself yeah that's false kathleen is that false for all sea turtles yep Wow. I guess maybe they don't need it as much living in the ocean. It's just a different type. There's just a different type of animal. Like it's mm. just a different. Number nine. How many eggs does a leatherback lay at a time? Is it 10 to 20, 60 to 80, 30 to 50, or 80 to 100?
It's 80 to 100. That's a lot of kids. If you guys had to fight over a tablet tonight, you know that that's a lot of siblings. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our final question is also true or false. A leatherback can eat its body weight in jellyfish in a single day. True or false? Yeah, that's true. Nice work, guys. I apologize to our pen and paper folks at home. Just because you're not appearing on our screen here doesn't mean that we don't appreciate your participation. <laughs> <laughs> so MW came in first on our on Kahoot online. So the next thing to do, guys, if you're interested in our prize draw, if you participated on Kahoot, send me your Kahoot name in an email. I'll make sure that our email goes into the chat here. And if you played on pen and paper, you can do the same. Just send me your regular old email saying that you'd like to be considered for our prize draw. I think your odds are good because when I looked at my numbers here, we had seven families. So on average, that's somewhere between 14 to 20 players and not all of those are, um, are young people. So send me an email and let me know if you want to be considered. Kathleen, before we wrap up, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about how, because we have Young Naturalist Club members across the province, how can we support the conservation of sea turtles in Nova Scotia and how can we directly support the Canadian Sea Turtle Network? Um, supporting conservation of sea turtles, I think, is is doing what you can to help keep the ocean healthy, right? So um, it's really important to consider, I mean, as I always think about, again, those fishermen doing the thing that was small in front of them, picking up the phone, telling us about a sighting, made such an enormous difference. So doing things like not releasing balloons, <laughs> you know, if you're celebrating outdoors, don't use balloons outside, keep those for inside, right? So that you don't risk them going out into the ocean. We pull up balloons every year from the ocean on our field boat. We just haul them out of the water, you know? Um, so it's it's managing waste is one thing. It's um, helping to, to ask, you know, I mean, a lot of kids have been involved in things like um, climate marches, and, and I'm not saying that you have to be an activist in that way, but it's paying attention to what's going on from the from that standpoint, because anything that affects the health of the ocean affects the health of sea turtles. Um, we we do, you know, we obviously we're a charity, so we appreciate any kind of fundraising helps in terms of supporting our our research and supporting the the educational outreach that we do. And I think just talking to people about sea turtles really matters. I think educating people that we have them in Canada is important. I'm so delighted to be able to talk to naturalists, a whole pile of young naturalists and their families about this because it's I think one of the coolest coolest species going in Canada, <laughs> um, and really a, a huge. Um, a huge part of our kind of natural history that I think not a lot of people know about because we've only kind of established officially from again, Western scientific standpoint um, that turtles are in Canadian waters is only 20 years ago, 25 years ago. So, so it's still new. And so I think it's a really cool thing to talk to people about and to tell them about. And I think one of the things that's, you know, one of the things I find important about the story of the leatherback when we're looking at talking to people, I mean, we all are growing up or you guys are growing up, I still feel like I'm growing up, but I'm older um, than that, <laughs> but is, um, I was eating gummy words a few minutes ago, but anyway, is that, um, is that they're kind of your, like the thing that I think is so interesting for Canadians about leatherbacks is if you care about leatherbacks, it's, it says something really important about you. It says not only do you, are you interested in kind of, you know, really weird <laughs> to animals that do kind of odd things, but it's, it's caring about something you can't see. And it's caring about something that for the most part, you're never going to touch, right? So leatherbacks, because they don't come onto land in Canadian waters, because it's so rare to find someone who, who actually gets to see them. Like it's a rare person. I just was listening to a video that someone had sent in the other day of a turtle that they saw back in July. And you're listening to the video and they're watching it. They're sailing just kind of there. It's on the North coast of Newfoundland. It was one of those really weird, very Northern sightings um, that are rare. And there's you, you could see the boat and they're like, what is that? I don't know. Is it a sunfish? Is it a rock? Is it a seal? And then you start hearing these, this boat full of adults going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, it's a sea turtle. It's a sea Like just so excited, so amazed, so thrilled um, because and they, I've never talked to someone who's seen a turtle in person who hasn't had that reaction, but there's so few people that actually get to do that. And so it's easy to care about the things that you see. And it's easy to care about the things that you run into on a daily basis or that are part of your daily life. It's hard harder to care about something 
that you're just hearing stories about that, you know, is around maybe because we've, I've shown you parts of their bodies and I've been able to see them. And we've got, you know, we've got this kind of story about the research that we do and things like that. And, and that's important, but it's the things that you can't actually yourself see and touch being able to care about those. That's a really critical skill set when we're looking at how we manage the kind of environmental issues that face us in the world. And so being able to remember that sometimes there are things you can't see that can capture your imagination. There's sometimes those are things that you really still have to be concerned about. Like that's, that's a huge thing in developing a conservation muscle because too often we just say, well, if it doesn't touch me in my daily life, it can't matter to me. Right. And I can't, you know, that causes a lot of issues because there's so much that we can't see in the world and the world is so diverse and the biodiversity is incredible and all of the issues are so complicated. So being able to have faith and caring about the thing that you know is out there, um, even if it's not something you touch yourself, uh, is, is really actually an important thing to do for conservation. <laughs> as weird as that might seem, as kind of tangential as that might seem, I, I really believe that to be true. And I think turtles are so important, leatherback turtles are so important too, because they kind of capture our imagination. One of the things I love is how they connect everybody um, from different parts of the world, right? And they're, you know, they're found all over the world in all kinds of oceans of the world. But, you know, the fact that here in Nova Scotia, we're really um, interested in what's going on in Colombia and in Mexico and Dominican Republic and, you know, in Trinidad and Guyana's, you know, when we have a leatherback that's making its way down into the Caribbean and we send a note to all of our colleagues down there and say, hey, and the turtle's coming. We don't know where she's going to go. Can you keep an eye out? People from, from multiple countries are like, let us know, we can't wait to help. The international cooperation that results as a result, as you know, when you have these highly migratory species is really critical to building things like peace in the world, right? So, so just learning how to talk to people from other cultures is a really important conservation skill, right? That helps particularly leatherbacks, right? Learning a foreign language, really helpful. I took high school Spanish and never thought I'd use it again in my life. I use it all the time because I'm randomly working with people from, you know, from countries where, where Spanish is the primary language. So just being alive to those things, even if they don't seem directly conservation oriented, actually really make a difference um, for, for species and how they're dealt with and how they're, how they're cared for in different countries. So including in Nova Scotia, because our turtles are not just Nova Scotian turtles, they're also Trinidadian turtles and, Cu and <laughs> turtles in Cuba and or Cuban turtles and Puerto Rican turtles and all these different countries um, where the turtles, Canadian turtles nest, right? So it's a shared resource and which means that ability to cooperate, those muscles that you develop about being open to people from different cultures, open to different ways of learning how to do things, all of those kinds of skills are, are really critical. That's so great, Kathleen. Thank you for that. So you guys have a list of activities to do then. So next birthday party, no balloons. We're going to practice being good neighbors. Bubbles. <laughs> Use bubbles. Bubbles. Yeah, bubbles are a great idea. Bubbles not balloons, yeah. <laughs> bubbles or some other balloon alternative. Um, we're going to watch for sea turtles on the beach. Maybe follow the Canadian Sea Turtle Network on Facebook. Is that the best place, Kathleen? Um, Instagram, we're on Instagram and Twitter where maybe we, our Facebook site was hacked repeatedly. So we had to pull it down. I know it was so disappointing. Um, I was like, no. So ultimately they took it down and we, they, they fixed it and Facebook fixed it for us. And then it got hacked again almost immediately. And so it's just a target site. I don't know why. So we've had to pull it off of Facebook. I, I we're talking about putting it back on, but I don't know what to do about it at this point. We're still sort of trying to see but right now we're on instagram at canada sea turtle as well and on twitter and uh we have our our blog and we have our website too so sea turtle.ca okay and in the summertime you guys have the booth downtown right yeah we're gonna open it think i hope this year it's been closed for two years because of covid and we typically have a summer camp too that we haven't been able to operate that we're hoping will be open this summer we're doing some last minute trying to sort out a venue for it uh that we might be able to depend on depending on COVID, but yeah, we do. And we're hoping to do more and I'll keep you posted actually, Becky. And if people are interested, they can, can hear from you too, about um, some programs where we have junior volunteers. So typically are, are the people who volunteer in university, but we really are interested in doing more of a mentorship program for younger people too. So if you're interested in volunteering at the sea turtle, um, at the sea turtle center on the waterfront for a couple of hours, it would be a mentorship situation. So you'd have one of the um, scientists or the, the student scientists who work with us, the interns um, who would be supervising you and you'd be able to talk to people about sea turtles and things like that. So um, that would be kind of fun and help run some pro programs that we do with little kids, including huge bubble blowing things. Um, but, uh, and and learning about, you know, and helping little kids learn about things that go on in the ocean. So we're trying to, to develop that program right now because I think it's really great for 
for children or young children, young people, teenagers who are naturalists to have the chance to, to do those things before they turn, you know, you don't want it just to be for people who are 18. Right. So, so we're trying to develop that too. Cool. Yeah. Well, we can definitely share those opportunities. That would be a great fit yeah. for a lot of our young naturalists club members. Uh, we have an older chapter called the nature guardians. So that might be a particularly good fit for because a lot of them are looking for opportunities like that. Um, when I volunteered for the network, I got to read through a bunch of old um, notes, I'm Sherman Blakely's notes, actually, and they were yeah. super interesting. So, yeah, so I can highly recommend getting involved. Yeah, we miss having, it's COVID's been really hard, right? Because typically this office is packed full of people and they're students and young people and everybody doing different things. And it's been so quiet for the last couple of years. So it's going to, I'm excited to build it back up again. It's been, it's been a, a really different little while <laughs> all yes, the people scanning things and yeah. <laughs> yeah all right guys um well we're at almost 8 30 now so thank you so much kathleen for all the time that you gave us tonight this was a super interesting talk and i'm really excited to see uh if any more questions or comments pop up in our chat as we uh, post this to youtube now um we'll definitely have to have you out in person at least within our halifax chapter maybe in the warmer months we go to a beach or something um <laughs> If folks, if you're new to the Naturalist Club, if you haven't been out to an in-person event before, we are restarting in-person events. Uh, well, really as of this week with the province's phase-based opening. So definitely follow us on social media. Um, sign up for emails if you aren't already, if you're in the Halifax area. Um, Karen McKendry is our awesome leader locally. Um, so Karen and Kathleen are great people to connect with about beaches and turtles and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, but we also have chapters across the province. So check out the website, check out Facebook, and yeah, get involved. Thank you, Kathleen and April. We'll end our stream here. And thank you, Young Naturalists, for coming out tonight. Nice to see all of you. Thank you so much.